Oh, there we are. We thought we might have been missing in action. <laughs> you never know. Well, here we are. We made it through another week, I think. Yep. Yeah. I got your picture out here. You guys okay now? Yep. Yep. Yeah, we were, we're okay good. all along. <laughs> we got the red star up there, or yellow star with a red background. How about that? Yep. Well, people. It's been an interesting week, again. It never stops. The Trump haters are out in full force. You know, there was a, I saw a discussion where about the Democrats and Republicans need to start realizing who they work for. Mm -hmm. And you know what my thoughts were when I saw that? Really? Really? We're a little bit beyond that. Uh, have you called your representatives lately? No, I really don't have anything to say to Terry Landry. You might. I don't. I, uh, well, let's put it this way. Like I said, I you might. The, when I, I don't. went to the Capitol last year, I don't think he likes me anymore. <laughs> well... He's, he's, you know he's my representative, and I didn't vote for him. I will tell you this. <clears throat> that, uh, we're putting together a meeting for August 10th, the Acadiana Patriots, and we're going to have John Schroeder there, who's running for, for uh, state treasurer. But the other thing that I'm working on there is to get as many of the representatives in this entire area, Acadia, Lafayette, Vermilion, St. Martinville, uh, Brobridge area, because all of them except aforementioned person voted against all the taxes. You know who else would be interesting to have with that mix? Michael Lunsford. He's coming. I think he's coming. Because, man, let me tell you, I like Michael Lunsford. He puts out some very, very factually accurate posts, oh. and he has got his finger on the pulse. I, you know? I, I honestly think he's looking at running for Well, something. he would do well because, you know, previously when you had, when you really wanted to get to the bottom of something, you used to go to the Dead Pelican and go to CB for Godston. Because I haven't seen Dead Pelican and Did They Die? I don't know what happened to the, the Dead Pelican after uh, a CB passed on. I don't know what they did with it. I haven't it. seen anything out of them. He was, he was the driving force, so he, they might have shut it down. But CB for Godston, based on his experience and his knowledge, I mean, if you had something you wanted to know, for example, I, I contacted him about the combined annual financial report for Louisiana. And CB laughed online quite a bit, and I asked him, I, I, I'd emailed him, I said, why are you laughing, CB? He said, well, we tried to get the combined annual financial report out of Jindal's bunch, uh, him and Moon both, and uh, only Jindal's inner circle had it and wouldn't release the public document. And you can go on any other city, parish, county, state, and get what their what their what mm -hmm. their uh, uh, investment portfolio is on the left hand side of the combined annual report. Not Louisiana. Gender wouldn't let it go because it showed we were not truly in the hole, and they've been lying about the taxes all along. Oh, well, they've been lying. And and you know, people like Schroeder and Guyman mm -hmm. and Henskin and, and them guys. We don't have a tax problem. We have a spending we problem. We have a spending problem. See, when you hear the legislators talk about this, the code word for it is the rainy day fund. They never call it what it really is because that's a code word. And the media is sworn to secrecy. You will never hear Louisiana or national media say the words combined annual financial report. You will not hear that. That no, is secret. And, and I, I went, and we may have talked about this a little bit last week, but... I went to the thing with Taylor Barrod, the Petroleum Club, mm -hmm. and, and listened to his talk. Woo. I can tell you, I don't think his favorite man at the Capitol is the governor. Well, there's a reason why, because all of his capital outlay was vetoed. All of Henskin's stuff in Vermilion was vetoed. I mean, all of that stuff is I, gone. I, here's, I, I, I told George this. They're, they're redoing Barrett School Road. And they cut know, the funding. They cut... He, 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 
cut one million dollars. So it's I, all I don't tore up. Funding for that, they can't stop building the road. Obviously, they will now. It's all tore up, and it's going to stay tore up because every dumbbell. person. And I got to put a shout out to Nancy Landry. She reported it too. She did a really good job on Facebook, mm -hmm. putting out a very very good article. I read it several times. It was and, good, and we've shared it many times. Uh, Nancy and I have not always seen eye to eye on a lot of things, but I got to give a shout out on this tax thing. She's on point with this. She is right on target. And the Acadiana delegation uh, oh. stayed strong. You know who I was particularly proud of? Freshman Scott Stefanski out of Crowley. Absolutely. Only in there first time, a couple months. Yeah, if that long. And, and uh, He got in there, and he, he his talk matched his walk. He jumped in with Bob Henskins and all those. And Hugh Val. Mm -hmm. Hugh Val did a great job. You had Julie Emerson. Mm -hmm. You have uh, an, a surprise, a little surprise. Uh, Kusan voted it this time around well, against all the taxes. That was smart. And, and uh, they all stuck together. The gang of no, as Julie calls them. The, the sad part is... The Democrats are very good at this. They demonized them. They demonized them. And one of the things that I like that Taylor Barra did, in the June article, the, the advertiser said that he should step down from his position. Oh, you mean the Advo liar? Yeah, well, here's the deal. The reporter was the only one, by the way, and I'll give him credit for that, at that luncheon was the advertiser, but he was probably sorry that he showed up. He was outnumbered vastly. No, not so much outnumbered. Uh, Taylor Barra spared no words. <laughs> Basically said that maybe you'll be my friend in two years. <laughs> well, how could he not be outnumbered? If he's one of the ones who oh. was for the Democrats and you're at a Republican conservative luncheon, he had to be outnumbered. Well, he but was the, outnumbered, but, but the you, thing was is Taylor gave no slack to him and blasted him for what he did. And here's here's the problem with that. And and this now we're talking on a state level, okay? A state level is doing the same thing with a democratic governor that they're doing at the federal level. Mm -hmm. It just rolls downhill. They mm -hmm. the the Dem the Republicans actually and it was just a, a, a tiny step. When you're talking 3% of $30 billion that you want to hold back. Because see, the whole deal is set up by the REC, where they recommend, they have this group of people, and they recommend what the budget should be based on per barrel of oil. And that's been wrong for how long? Now, I want to ask you oil people, and if I'm wrong, call me, but when's the last time a barrel of oil was over $50? So they set up the budget this year at $51 a barrel. So, <laughs> Optimistic. And guess what it's at right now? I haven't looked lately. What, what is it, 42, 43? That's already a deficit. So here we go now. We're going to have the mid-year crisis again. They, they wanted to hold back on the rainy day fund mm -hmm. and, and only give them, I forget what it was, $50 million or something like that originally. Then they went to $80 million and it ended up they got all, all of what they wanted. It says right now, six hours ago, it closed at $47.12. Oh, well, we, we almost on budget. But here's another thing that, that, that Dumbbell did that we haven't talked about. Dumbbell just started a new program called a Constituent Services Office. Oh, yeah. Now, we're in the middle of a budget crunch. He's crying about don't have enough money. He's crying about taxes and this and that. And here he goes. He wants to start a whole new bureaucracy. And he did. He did. Here it is. His Constituent Services mm -hmm. Office. So... We have, we have an election coming up for state treasurer. There are four viable candidates. Not the, well, we're gonna tell you about one of the candidates. <laughs> you have your meeting tomorrow night.
Mm -hmm. At Elise's? 6.30. At 6.30. Yep. And a lot of the stuff we talk about tonight and what we don't get to talk about will be discussed at that meeting. I want to tell you about one of the candidates for the state treasurer race. What do you think? Oh, this is a good one. Ron, what'd you say? Caesar. Caesar, candidate for state treasurer, issues a call to arms against white policemen. <laughs> this is a candidate for the state treasurer. The thing about Caesar is he is a social justice warrior. Remember that, SJW, that's it. You see SJW, it means social justice warrior. To him or everything, is a nail and to social justice warrior, everyone is a racist. This explains Caesar and his wackiness. He authentically is crazy. <laughs> this article is from the uh, uh, Hayride. An internal investigation, FBI has found recently a majority of gunmen targeting cops just because they are cops found revenge inspired by Black Lives Matters movement the media's assault on police shootings, and criticism from politicians motivated them. Thank you, Mr. Caesar, and those who believe and speak as you do. I don't need to read this whole thing, but you get the point. Let's take that a step further. Dallas County Commissioner votes against honoring the Dallas cops who were murdered, saying that, quote, they brought it on themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, here's also something that, folks, I bet you didn't know. The higher-ups, this guy, the mayor, and several other politicos stopped the Dallas police officers from wearing the heavy SWAT armory, ar uh, armor to go to the event. That which is probably, so interesting. Well, they said they, they said they didn't want to offend Black Lives Matter because it would have looked too aggressive and it would have saved their lives. You so know, if that's I'm, a word that has come out in our dictionary, offend. So I, me. I hope the widows <laughs> sue those commanding officers oh, deep, hard, and continuous yeah. because that was a major factor in why they died. If they would have had their SWAT raid armor, they'd still be alive, most of them. See, see you look at this. Okay, let's look at something in the election for the state treasurer. What's going on in New Orleans? Mm -hmm. There are 18 people qualified for mayor. 18. And all except probably one or all. Do you think there will be a runoff? <laughs> you think? New Orleans voters may sway treasurer's pick. New Orleans voters have a big decision on their hand this fall when they'll choose Mayor Mitch Landrieu's successor. Let me give you a little thing that's happened and then we're going to get into the why the New Orleans voters oh, would... Die. He could come out of hiding then. Look. <laughs> New, <laughs> yeah. He's hiding. Yeah, his nice house is empty. Wife <laughs> left him. From my understanding, he's living with his concubine friend and their new baby. Did they have the baby yet? I don't know. I don't know. Anyways... I don't keep up with his here, shack up. Here's what happens. I'm involved down there, so... New Orleans Coalition unveils agenda to aid the next mayor. Oh, boy. City Council and preserve, this is the killer, preserve Landrew's progress. That sounds like the Democrats now trying to preserve Obama's legacy. That's <laughs> like, I mean. I what progress? They have a whole list. They have things, public safety. Infrastructure. There ain't there's no public safety down there. Public safety. After 20 sniper shootings, there's no public safety. That And that's the longest list. If you look at this list, then they have another one, infrastructure. <clears throat> yeah, how many parking lots will Andrew own when this is all over? Uh, economic opportunity. Now, you know, the crime rate is shot out of, you know, like a cannon. And... I read every day about people saying, well, I was going to go to New Orleans, but I'm not going. One guy said he was going to take his family, and this is a shame, to the World War II Museum. Mm. He said, I ain't going down there. Oh, no. Nope. We're in the middle of World War III. You don't want to go to the World War II Museum. Now, here's another one of the 
committees for that group. City services. Let's see. Andrew's cousin is pouring the cement that for the remake on Bourbon Street. The reason it's going to take longer, I did a little research on this and got some interesting emails. All the, the pipes and water and lines and all that underneath is 90 years old. So they're replacing all that. They gave a contract to a company, but that wasn't part of the contract. And now the company who's supposed to pour the concrete has to wait until... <laughs> till the pipes are relayed, and they're going to do this block by block. How much money are they going to make? Oof. Yeah. City finance. It says, commit to maintaining a balanced budget. <laughs> balanced budget with Landrew? Spend a million dollars of the city's money to take down monuments? Yep. It and says, hire private contractors in place of police. It says, identify and support the reforms necessary to ensure long-term health of municipal pension system. You know, one of the biggest budget items in the state is the pension, and it's in the hole big time. Has been for a while. Now, civil service system. <laughs> oh. Let's see, what's one of them? Fully implement the great place to work reforms in substance and spirit. I don't think you can call New Orleans a great place to work in any way, shape, or fashion. It's kind of like being on a scaffold scrubbing manure out the bottom of a commode bowl. <laughs> and, and the people, one of the people that's really pushing all this stuff doesn't Did even live here no. anymore. I understand, I heard that. I have to keep under control. But <laughs> The group will unveil its latest platform this week after 18 people, including veteran politicians, businessmen, and political rookies, signed up for a chance to become the city's next mayor during the three-day qualifying period for October 14th that ended Friday. All told, a whopping 66 contenders qualified to run for 15 different offices with the mayor's race drawing the biggest crowd. Here's the reason that I was going into this article besides informing you this coalition. The thing is, is that the mayor's race is going to bring a lot of people, a lot of people out to vote. And I hope a lot of angry conservatives show up to vote mm. well, over I, those monuments. I haven't gotten any word on who in that bunch of 18 is the best one. What's his name, Skurlock? Skurlock. He seems to be a conservative. Yeah. And there was a city council lady who was the only one that voted against right. the monuments. Right. And I, I met her when I was at Rock and Bowl for a, a thing. I was really impressed with that. I mean, about 400 people showed up on a Sunday afternoon when it was raining. They were mad. At that deal. And I, that was pretty impressive to me. I met Mr. Stewart, who has Buku Bucks and he's pushing things right now. Met a lot of very interesting people. George... Uh, uh, Peterson? Huh? Peterson? Yeah, that guy. He's being followed by the city police. I mean, when, when you look at this, uh, they said the wild card candidate here is Angela Davis. Yep. A Republican and a former top aide to both Democrat Landrew when he was lieutenant governor. Wasn't she one of the ones in the, uh, in the House that, that allowed the, uh, that, that nasty uh, spending bill to get out to the, uh, to the floor, mm -hmm. her and the three others, Julie Stokes and the rest? Yeah, and, and we had a shout out for Julie. She's in the battle of her life. She has breast cancer. I uh, just read a really... Uh, good article that she wrote that she's focusing on her family and taking care of it. Well, we just got news. John McCain's got a brain tumor. What a shock. Yeah, we knew he had a tumor, but... Yeah, we knew something was wrong with him, but we didn't think he was organic. No, no, we, we thought it was just lack of testosterone. I, have to be nice, you know. I am being nice. He screwed this country over for the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. 
well done on judges. Him and his gang of eight ruined uh, the country from the standpoint of allowing judges to get in who should never have been there. Here, here, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. For New Orleans, it's an awful important election. But just like you say all the time, are the people going to come out? Mm -hmm. Is there going to be intimidation? You do know that Landrew has his own private army. Is that the best word? Yep, they're private contractors, literally. Private contractors. And I'd like to know who's paying them. If he can play private contractors, then he could pay more police. Because contractors probably get five, six, eight times the amount a police officer would per hour or per day. So funny he can hire those, but he won't have any more in OPD. I, and you know what? I don't think people realize when Landrew took office, he fired 500 police officers. Yeah, right now they're even lower than that. There are another 300 under that now. They used to have about 1,600, and they're barely at eight right now. But that's because some are leaving. And, and what the mainstream media didn't tell you is that there weren't as many police at those monuments, protecting the monuments, as you think, because they some said they're not going. Well, my contact at NOPD said they flat refused, and they had to scrape to try to find cops to go out there and work that monument detail. Why do you think they were wearing those ISIS masks? And another thing, too, that I was told, uh, I was told that there were quite a few black police officers who refused to go out there and do that detail as well, quite a few. I... I we were in New Orleans, or Kenner, not New Orleans, Kenner. It's close enough. Close enough. We talked to people down there. And, and the biggest frustration I heard is, is that there weren't enough people that were angry about this. Businesses are being hurt. Now, if, they tore, if Bourbon Street is tore up, that means people are not. But the thing is, is that uh, I I want to go. I would like to go to the World War II Museum, but I'm not gonna. I'm gonna make you a prediction, Jim. The biggest money maker for this state is Mardi Gras. Oh. And if we continue to have sniper shootings, we've already had 20 in just the last two months. If that level of violence continues to escalate along the same pattern that it is now, with the monument removal and the overall anger over Mitch Landrieu and the rest. They are going to lose billions this coming February. Well, some of the some of the word I got, and I have a friend that's in one of those big crews. Crews said that that crew he's in is having meetings right now about pulling out and going to places like Metairie. And also, they can also pull out and they can go to Mississippi mm -hmm. and Alabama to there because they have Mardi Gras celebrations over there too. Mobile has a very big. Uh, Mardi Gras over there. The big picture here, and, and something I learned with all this taking place, let's look at Detroit. Detroit looked like a bombed out city. Looked like Hiroshima after the right. bomb. Guess what? Detroit is now on the upswing. Okay, and it's coming back. Okay, why? What they did is the same thing that's going on in New Orleans. Democrat land swindle. Yep. It's a mm -hmm. land scam. In other words, they want the good people to move out of New Orleans. You don't care. Then what they're going to do is the same thing they did in Detroit. The money people go in there and buy the businesses and the property for cheap and bring them back. Developed. And develop them and make a ton of money. And that, and talking to the people that have close relationship in New Orleans, is what they feel is going on. Well, Jim, you just described what could be happening in Chicago. The, the feds drop, uh, drop weapons to the gangs and let the gangs fight it out and create a total atmosphere of crime and fear. And Chicago could be doing the same thing. Let it do the same path, boil over, places be overrun with crime, burned out, burned down, and they do the same thing in Chicago. Well, having lived in Milwaukee for 16 years, Chicago has always been like this. 
I mean, the corruption in Chicago, dailies, goes back to the dailies. But your theory still carries weight oh, yeah. in Chicago because oh, no doubt. if you have feds that are dropping cases of guns and, on the corners in gang territory for them to find and use, that's like fast and furious on steroids. What are they trying to accomplish? They're trying to create a bad enough war zone and what you've just said about New Orleans, Detroit. Genocide. Okay. Yeah. That's part of Chicago. The South Side. Oh, but nobody wants to talk about black on black violence. Well, I, I remember nobody wants to talk about that. When GE went on strike, I took a job driving trucks. You were brave. And I had to deliver to the South Side. Like I said, you were brave. After my third trip there, that's enough. I brought the semi back, parked it in the yard, went in and said, I'll take my last paycheck. I'm not going in that neighborhood again unless you put a 50 caliber machine gun in my truck. <laughs> and that's not going to I mean, anymore. honestly, you would be driving down the street to go make a delivery, and 10 of them would get in front of your truck. Mm. And I had no weapon, not allowed to carry a weapon in the truck. But I had a truck. <laughs> a big truck. <laughs> a big truck. And and they weren't as brave, but you were had the fear that they would jump up. Doors are locked. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll go get in the cab. <laughs> you know, after a couple of experiences like that, I said, no. I'm sorry, the money was good. But it wasn't worth it. And, and you see, th this is really sad for America. This is the greatest country in the world. And we got people like the Democrats and the poor sissy losers. You lost. You didn't have a good candidate. People realized you didn't have a good candidate. Did we have the best candidate? Mm, you know? Speaking doing okay, though. of the candidate, here are some uh, uh, things about Democrats when they say that Trump is oh. not the best candidate oh, yeah. or he is inappropriate. Is I'm going to go down my historical listing. Ted Kennedy left a woman to die in a river. Bill Clinton had weird relations in an Oval Office with a barely legal intern. <laughs> Obama ran guns to Mexican drug lords and gave billions to terrorists. Biden makes creepy and sexist comments and publicly fondles women. <laughs> Hillary Clinton endangered Americans, released classified intel, wiped her illegal server clean, destroyed mobile devices, left four American heroes to die, lied about it being caused by a stupid BS video, sold nuclear material to our enemies, and took money from terrorist-producing countries. John Edwards was indicted for using campaign funds to hide his mistress. Rod Blagojevich is in prison for trying to sell Obama's Senate seat, and Anthony, the Oscar Mayer wiener, well, he doesn't have to wish he was the Oscar Mayer wiener, because I'm sure they've showed him that. So now, um, how are you going to lecture <laughs> on, uh, on what is beneath a political office as a Democrat, and how you can talk about uh, Trump is inappropriate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, to add to that list, we have a question here. Susan Rice, net worth revealed. Did she make $50 million working in Obama's government? No, but she was under Hillary and under Obama, and Obama came out 438% richer, mm -hmm. so he's got to spread the slush around. Well, here's a paragraph says a career in public sector pays very well obviously better than most of the jobs in the country at her peak income rice was earning $172,000 a year that's pretty good considering that when accounting for a 30 percent tax rate she's still bringing home $120,000 a year yeah but even my common However, core math rice net worth is 50 million even by common core math, that ain't $50 million. <laughs> that begs the question, how does someone who spent their life in the public sector, sector have that high of a net worth? Jim, when, how much was that money that went missing under Hillary Clinton when oh, she was God. at the Secretary of State's Trillions. office? State Department lost all that money. I think there's something about $50 million of it. Yeah. A little bit. 
So fun fact, Susan Wright has a net worth of 50 million as a career U.S. public servant on a maximum salary of $172,000. I was in the wrong field. Well, starting off, Wright's income at her peak was just over on. That means she was getting raises from the government as she was promoted. Let's assume she made that throughout her entire career. Hopped on the victorious Bill Clinton bandwagon in 1992. So, that total, grand total, would come to 4128000 Not 10 times that. For Rice to obtain a $50 million net worth, she would have spent just under 300 years working for the government. Hey, <laughs> why doesn't the IRS investigate? Oh, but wait, she's not a, uh, a white, uh, right-leaning conservative. That invalidates that complaint. Darn. Part of those investments... Boy, if she was a white guy, she'd get it. Part of those investments were in concepts that Obama administration spent the latter part of their time in office opposing oil. And, I mean, we all know where that money came from. Look, we spent, what, 50 million worldwide fixing mosques? You know, I always said to Tom, I said, you know, Tom, if I come back in another life, I'll be a politician and be rich. You know, I was telling Jim at supper, I saw something that was interesting, and I didn't realize the significance of it because I was younger and not quite as politically savvy. Folks, do y'all realize that we fought the war, the, the war in Bosnia, Bill Clinton was blowing stuff up over there. We brought out Slobodan Milosevic on war crimes. You know what his war crime was? He was killing Muslims. So we bombed, rocketed, and prosecuted the Christians who were killing the Muslims. Food for thought, y'all. Also, the Bosnia situation was not just about that. Bill Clinton cleared the way for Bosnia to be the European drug hub so Daddy Bush and Bush Jr. and the rest of them could ship their illegal drugs from Afghanistan on to Bosnia and then be able to network into Europe from there. So that was the real reason for it. But, you know, it never hurts to go blow a few Christians up. You know, it's popular. It never hurts. Well, I mean, people better wake up. And by the way, notice in that conflict, they got Slobodan Milosevic, the Christian on war crimes. Who for 1,400 years has got all the war crimes going on? The Muslims? I didn't hear of a Muslim chief coming out of that conflict on national uh, war crimes tribunal on, under the UN, under the Hague Convention. No, it was a Christian. Interesting. Well, the other thing is, we did take $500 million from the UN. They're not happy. I think we ought to take more. Yeah. Well, the, the thing you know, that... I, I, I saw an article that said that, that UN building would make a great veterans hospital. Well, that's where I was going. They should kick the UN completely off of the North American continent and say, <laughs> y'all can go somewhere else but not here. Because the, uh, the Small Arms Treaty, the Paris Climate Accords, and all of that stuff, we did not sign up for any of that stuff. None yeah. of it was validated and it's all a bunch of Ponzi schemes. And, and it is a Ponzi scheme because the only reason they're upset that Trump pulled out is because we never pulled in. It was never voted on by the Senate, which makes it totally illegal. Another one of the Obama administration's going around the government and signing us for something that was not legal. The second part of that is all they were interested in are trillion dollars. And taking our guns. And, and taking our guns. That's the other thing. And well, you know, it's funny that you brought that up because I was reading that 25 years ago today, the big concern was another green hoax, the ozone hole in the atmosphere. Oh. And, and Bush uh, got rid of the fluorocarbons on the market and the Freon was replaced by other more expensive chemicals. Guess what, folks? We're still here. The hole in the ozone was another farce. And in 2015, Al Gore said there would be no ice. The bears would all be dead. Guess what? Greenpeace, every year for the last two years, has been locked in the Antarctic ice four or five times and have to been rescued 
in ice that Al Gore said wasn't going to be there. I, I don't know if people saw the pictures, you know, the oil, oil, we don't want to put pipelines, you know, like in Alaska. And <laughs> We've already stuff. got pipelines. Huh? And they had videos of the polar bears. They like it. It's warm. They, they go next to the pipes because they're warm. Mm -hmm. You have to warm the oil up to make it flow. I mean, yeah, you know, that climate change. You know what's funny though, Jim? <laughs> climate change is not just a hoax. It's not just a Ponzi scheme. Because if you start looking around, the communists did something very interesting with that. It's actually a religion. There are people who with religious fervor will argue about the religion of climate change. They will fight you and come to blows and want to kill you because you deny climate change. It is a religion for these people. And I, I dare people to argue that with me. These people are basing their strongest beliefs on junk science that has been completely disproven in every way, shape, or fashion. And a boatload of the scientists two years ago got caught and admitted they falsified the data to get grants. They admitted it. But you cannot tell these true believers that that stuff is not real. And uh, I got a friend of mine who's got uh, younger relatives who are uh, millennial age. And you, you ought to talk to them. It, it, it's like arguing, arguing with the wall. I mean, oh, no, oh, no, you're wrong. No, the, the climate well, scientists say this, 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 this. I, 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 I'm looking at what's going on today with the young people, it, it actually started back when we were raising our kids. Well, the I, communists. I, 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 look, I, look at, I look at how rebellious one of my kids was and how they talked back. Man, if I had talked back to my parents, my head would have been. But here's the big story. The 60s hippie crowd that was at Woodstock mm -hmm. had kids and raised them, and that's what happened. Uh, I'm guilty. No. <laughs> you're, you're, you weren't, you weren't, no, 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 there, there's... I was not at Woodstock, but... No, but there was mo much worse than that. Deals. <laughs> but I'll But I'll tell you what, this, go, this goes back to the 30s whenever the... Uh, whenever the uh, ACLU was created, because the ACLU, the Anti-Christian Lawyers Union, mm -hmm. was created to give Communist Party members free legal representation in the U.S. And that was back in the 30s. <laughs> so folks, the handwriting was on the wall back then, and the Anti-Christian Lawyers Union has not done anything positive since. They are, they are a, a thorn in the side of anything good and conservative. And then you've got the Southern Poverty Law Center coming right behind them. They're... they're even worse. I, I mean, when you watch, now, I, you know, I, I was at a, a meeting, a luncheon thing, they introduced a new guy for Americans for Prosperity here, but what I'm looking at in Americans for Prosperity is the two guys that were in that room. The one guy is leaving, Ross is leaving to go work for John Kennedy. And, and one of the things that I liked what I saw about that picture is these are young people with their heads screwed on. They, they are the hope. They are the hope. I'll tell you another young man that was very encouraging with his work ethic was John Fleming's uh, mm -hmm. son, J.C. Fleming. Uh, he helped his daddy in his campaign, and he was a pretty successful, successful campaigner. And he's gone on to manage a restaurant chain in Texas. And that young man uh, sat with us at many... And he's an attorney. He sat with us at many a New Orleans Tea Party meeting. And uh, he did an excellent job in his father's campaign. You know, and, and I don't know how we turn it around. That there's so much money flowing. You said it earlier. We, we can't figure out who's paying for the boatloads of people coming into Italy and Ger Germany and... Who's paying for that? I it's mean, not free. You're right. It could be easily found out. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to know. No, what? No. Might turn up like I a, guarantee you the mainstream media knows. It might turn up like the two guys who investigated Hillary and Haiti. They might turn up, or, or the federal well, prosecutor. They might turn up like him. I'll tell you what. Going to the beach. I read an down. article where some of the Dems were, were shaken by the last 
knockoff. I mean, well, they better wake up and smell the coffee because the you see, the Hillary assassination train is still running wild and free. How how can this continue? I, I mean, that's the problem. It's not just Democrats. What the heck are the Republicans doing, Jim? It's like I said, I said a couple of shows <laughs> ago. George W. Bush and his Attorney General and FBI had almost all the information they have on Hillary right now. They mm -hmm. just they, they had they had thirty years of, of dead bodies and twelve major scandals, if I count them correctly, and probably one hundred and fifty dead bodies. Back then, it was probably one hundred and thirty dead bodies. Okay. And not a thing was said, not a thing was done, and that's when George Bush had control of the whole pie. Nothing was done. Why would anything get done now? In fact, it's so bad right now that people are screaming because Obama actually put the brakes on the asset forfeiture programs where the police can operate like land pirates, and if you got more than $100 in your pocket in cash, take your money, and you got to go to court to prove it's legit, and then you still may not get it all back. Jeff Sessions just put that program in full speed and gave it some more authority. It's, it's, it's robbery and theft at the basic level of law enforcement. And he put it in there and he says, oh, that program is a valuable asset to law enforcement. Well, I guess it is. They're entitled to be pirates on the land and steal from you and do whatever the hell they want. And you I'm have to... like the Jennings cop that wanted me to pay for the ticket. Well, well, let I me do. tell you. Let me tell you a little story once upon a time. <laughs> once upon a time, back in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a sheriff in Jefferson Davis Parish. And his deputies were famous. They pulled over an 18-wheeler full of color TV sets, and one deputy goes up front and keeps him busy writing the ticket, and the other deputy backs a truck up, un opens the 18-wheeler, and half the TV sets are unloaded and stolen by the deputies. <laughs> and that was under that, under that sheriff's auspices in Jefferson Davis Parish. <laughs> And then you had Sulphur and Vinton over there, and they were famous for relieving people of money. And then, of course, locally, we have, as the French would say, the pièce de résistance. Scott Police Chief Jerry Carpenter caught live on dash cam planting cocaine and drugs in some Vietnamese's vehicle so he could take their cash. And he forgot to turn off the dash cam. <laughs> Now, what would have happened, because see, these Vietnamese shrimpers were going, I think they had over, I think it was 25000 or 50000 some I mean, large sum of money in cash to go buy a shrimp boat. And he decided he wanted it. So guess what? He decided to steal it and set them up, but he left the camera on. Now, what happened if he hadn't left the camera on? Oh, my God. How many times have officers done things like that or pulled people over in, in Sulphur Venton area and if you had more than a couple hundred in your pocket, they seized it. They took it. They just took it because they could. Because they have a gun and they have a license to kill you. Now, here's something else that somebody told me. A lot of people now, when they interact with police on a traffic stop, will only roll the window down about an inch and hand the documents out legally. It's all you have to do. Why, folks? Because how many times has an officer got up in court and lied and said they smelled the odor of marijuana, so now they have the probable cause to tear the vehicle apart and search it from stem to stern. But no marijuana was ever found. I have to remember that. How many times has that happened? I watched a, a live PD this week where they did the very same thing, and not a single speck of marijuana was found in the car. But those cops insisted, oh, we could smell the odor of marijuana, and they took the guy out and they searched him. There was nothing. There was nothing. And by the way, uh, one, of the, one of the recent court rulings has come out that, uh, that now they're starting to even challenge the dog. That just the alert of a dog without other corroborating probable cause is not enough because the dogs are not 100%. Well, don't tell them people on the border that. <laughs> but, but, but the stuff on the border is way past that. We're, we're, we're in open combat on the border. Yeah. But them x-ray machines are pretty good on Well, that's a different, that's a dog of a different color. <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, the, the courts are now ruling that the dogs in and of themselves, because see, this is an intimidation tool. They got you on the side of the road. Supreme Court doctrine has said in case law, you have between 20 and 30 minutes for a police officer on the side of a road in a traffic stop to establish probable cause. Mm -hmm. Then they got to either 
take a dump or get I, off the box. I, I went through that. Well, here we go. And say Martin Perry. What they will do then is, well, you know, if you, if you ain't going to let us search the car, we're going to call the dog. It's going to take the dog 45 minutes for an hour to get here. That's an intimidation tool. You want to get where you want to go. It's hot. You're on the side of the road. You're feeling that heat. So they're going to try to coerce you by making you wait. Now, they will use the famous term, well, this is an investigative detention. You're not under arrest. I say bull hockey. I say bull hockey. Because if you are not free to leave, you're under arrest. That's the magic words to ask those cops. Am I free to leave or not? I got pulled over on the Chafalaya Bridge because the police officer came up on my bumper like this. And there was a guy pulling a boat next to me. And once I got past him, I pulled over and that guy sped up. And he said, I made an illegal lane change. Pulled me off on there. And we get off. Never tells me. Never, never told me why I got pulled over. And we're, I'm going on 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I'm going like, I wasn't speeding. That I know. I'm not dumb. I got a cop on my butt. Finally, I, I looked at him and I said, uh, Sir, I'm going to leave. If you can't tell me why you pulled me over because I didn't do anything wrong, then I'm going to leave. You better be careful. He'll get you for resisting arrest. And he said, I, if I were you, I would go back there, stand by your car. Uh-huh. And he had his hand on his gun. Yep, he's getting ready to arrest you for, uh, yeah, for well, resisting. Anyways, he, he made me open this. I was working for GE, all my equipment, parts. And again, that, again, that just, just what I said. Why would he do that? Where is the probable cause? What was the reasonable suspicion that you, as an honest a uh, businessman going down the road would need to have all your stuff look through. Having worked 16 hours, by the way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tired, want to get to the house. Anyways, it took it was 45 minutes. Wrote me a ticket for the illegal lane change. So what I did the next day, being who I am, <laughs> I went to St. Martin Parish to pick up my driver's license, but I didn't go to pay the fine. I went to see the DA. DA called over. I told him the whole thing, everything that took place. He says, okay, I'm going to take care of the ticket. You go get your license mm -hmm. back. Now, I'm not going to tell what happened when I went to get my license. That wasn't nice. But the whole the whole thing was two weeks later, that, that officer shot and killed his wife in the Atchafalaya Basin. Think about that. Mm -hmm. This was a idiot, a dangerous idiot. Well, the problem is, is that we have found at the state police level that the people that they hire are all based on politics, not on merit, not on talent, not on any of those things. They're all based on just that. But it, you know, I want to go back to a subject we've seen and heard a lot about. The cruel result of higher minimum wage levels. Now I now know when I was growing up, I took some of those jobs. We all did. It was first to, first to job work, you ever had. To work, you know, like I one of the jobs I had was making submarine sandwiches on Saturdays and Sundays at mm -hmm. a at a store at a five and dime store mm -hmm. you know and i got paid the minimum wage which wasn't anywhere near what it is today but still it was at the times never once did i ever look at that even when i got out of the military <clears throat> and i was trying to get some money together to buy a house and i was working three jobs two full-time jobs and a part-time job <laughs> on the weekend but I never looked like the people do today that that part-time job should be like my full-time living. That was supplemental income to buy whatever. Today, there are political movements to push the federal minimum hourly wage to $15. Raising the minimum wage has popular support among Americans. 
Their reasons include fighting poverty, preventing worker exploitation, and providing a living wage. For the most part, the intentions behind the support for raising the minimum wage are decent, but when we evaluate public policy, the effect of the policy is far more important than the intentions. So let's examine the effects of increases in minimum wage. The average wage for a cashier is $10 an hour, about $21,000 a year. That's no great shakes, but it's an honest job full or part time. In anticipation of a $15 an hour wage becoming federal law, many firms are beginning to beginning the automation process to economize their labor usage. Panera Bread, a counter-served cafe chain, anticipates replacing most of its cashiers with kiosks. McDonald's is rolling out several service kiosks that allow customers to order and pay for their food without ever having interact with a human. Momentum Machines has developed a meat flipping robot, <laughs> which can turn out 360 hamburgers in an hour. These and other measures direct responses to the rising costs. Okay, let's look what happened in San Francisco. Okay, San Francisco might give us some evidence for what $15 minimum wage does. According to the East Bay Times, about 60 restaurants around the Bay Area closed between September and January. 60 restaurants closed in less than six months. So people are out of work. A recent study by Michael Luca of Harvard Business School and Dara Lee Luca of Mathica Policy Research calculated for every $1 hike in minimum hour wage, there is a 14% increase in the likelihood that a restaurant rated three and a half stars on Yelp will go out of business. Mm. That, I, I'm gonna bring that up because the minimum wage was never meant to provide a, a living wage. First off, constitutionally, you are only guaranteed life, <coughs> liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You are guaranteed the freedoms to pursue what you want. That's not freedom. That is tyrannical government oh. ordering a private business to do something that they do not need to be doing. First, second off, Jim and I talked about this. The reason why it's called a minimum wage job is because it is paid a minimum wage. And that is because it is a bottom level, non-skilled job. It's not like a plumber. It's not like an electrician. It's not like any type of job that takes specialized training and skills. It is the type of job that a person with zero skills, zero experience, no life experience, can go get a job and start making money. And that's what all of us in this room did. I worked at the Acadia Parish School Board warehouse in college during the 110 degree heat wave in uh, 1980, and we liked to cook. But I was there, I was making, I don't know what it was back then, about five, ten an hour. And I made my little money and I paid for my car and my insurance and all my stuff. And it was not meant for anyone to feed a family off of or to pay for the rest of their life. And this is because you have a group and a class of people who are a parasitic class on this society. And I say parasitic because they're like a sucker fish. They're always complaining about how they're victims and how they're being kept oh, yeah. back and how they're being kept down and all this other stuff. Okay, the next time one of y'all want to complain about this, that, and the other, I got, I got a plan for you. And I know in New Iberia, you go down by Yard Street and you go sit in front of the, uh, of the welfare office, the food stamp office, okay? And I want you people to go sit out there and I want you people to sit there for a little while and I want you to count the Beamers, the Escalades, and the Jaguars that come there to pick up their food stamps. And I I want you to look at the women in the $100 hairdos and the $80 nails with their free Obama phones and tell me how these people have been held back and how they've been held down and they're the oppressed and they're the victims. I want you to tell me how that works. And then they go back to their Section 8 housing where they're paying $10 a month and when their kids commit crimes and they commit crimes, they're judgment proof because they have absolutely not a darn thing you can take. Let me 
or Jim, Mr. T, Hartwell, Joe, let us go commit a crime. Oh, they're going to seize our house. They're going to seize our bank accounts. They're going to seize our money. We used to call this class of people judgment proof because they can get away with anything they want and they're not accountable to anything. You throw them in jail, they come back out and they ain't lost a darn thing and they even get a free lawyer. Over the last eight years, empowerment. Yes, that's all that's done. Empowerment. And we're seeing that by people blocking roads. Oh. Crime. Look at crime in New Orleans, how it's escalated. Oh. Antifa, BLM. Oh, yes. No, you can't, you can't do it. On the second hour, uh, we have some interesting stuff. Again, the state police. Again. The, again. It just never stops. It, it's, it, we can't make this stuff up. I mean, honestly, there's so much stuff. We don't know which stuff to talk about. You know, we could spend the whole two hours on the federal government. Or on New Orleans. Or on New Orleans. <laughs> Little either, Mitch. Either on, you know. I mean, really, it's, hey, it, it's the world we live in today, and it got to change. But we'll be back for the second hour. Same bat time. God bless all of you. Same God bat channel. America.